Today's video is on fire management. I'm gonna show you my entire process from start to finish, how I prep my splits, how I build my coal bed, and how I maintain stable temperatures throughout the entire cook. I'm gonna show you every single fire check throughout the course of a three hour cook, and all the tools that I use today will have a non-affiliated link in the description. So let's get started. Here's my Workhorse Pits 1975 that I'll be doing today's demonstration on. I never use charcoal briquettes in my smoker, but I'm using them today to replicate how I like to maintain the size, shape, and location of my coal bed during my entire cook. I create two separate mounds of coals, creating an air channel down the middle for airflow, and naturally you'll have airflow on both sides of the coal bed as well. Now split size is very important. For my 24 inch firebox, 14 inch splits are the perfect size. I like to keep the entire coal bed split and fire as close to the firebox door as possible. And a 14 inch splint allows me to lay the split parallel to the firebox door. You can see there's coals underneath the entire split with airflow in the middle and both ends. The airflow will prevent smoldering and the entire split will burn evenly. I know with this setup I can place a split, leave the fire unintended for 30 to 45 minutes and I'll come back to a perfectly burned split that will be ready to be broken down into even coals. Now if I used longer splits on this setup, it clearly won't work. There's too much of an air gap, there's no coals underneath the ends of the splits, which would cause the ends of the splits to smolder and burn unevenly, causing dirty smoke, and as a result, fire management will be very unpredictable and more time consuming. You can definitely use longer splits in this firebox, however you would have to lay them long ways, and as a result, your fire and coal bed will move very close to the cooking chamber, and I'm trying to prevent that. Now this isn't an issue if you're only cooking on the left half of the cooking chamber, but if my smoker is loaded up with food and I'm cooking on the right half, a fire and coal bed that's close to the food will cause the food on the right side to cook faster and you have the potential for scorching or getting bottom burn on your food. There's just too much radiant heat if your food's that close to the fire. And as you can see right here, the coal bed is extremely hot. It's over a thousand degrees. You can see the importance of keeping your food as far away from the coal bed as possible, allowing time for the heat and gases to cool down before reaching the cooking surface. And again, I'll stress, if you're only cooking on the left half of the chamber, this pit is long enough, so coal bed placement is not as critical in those situations. Here's an example of a fire that's way too close to the cooking chamber. The flames are almost being sucked into the chamber. There's way too much radiant heat in the situation, and when smoking, radiant heat is bad. You really wanna primarily cook with convection. To explain radiant heat in another way, have you ever been next to a large campfire and you have to use your hand to shield your face from the heat? That's the radiant heat I'm trying to avoid. You want to cook with convection. Convection is king. It's that hot, fast-moving, smoky air that makes Texas barbecue so good. Barbecue joints have huge thousand-gallon smokers that have a ton of convection, which renders fat quickly and creates that beautiful color. Another way I prevent flames from being sucked into my cook chamber is the air intake on my firebox. My smoker has a bow tie air intake that I do not use and I keep closed. I found using the bow tie creates too strong of an airflow directly on the coal bed, causing the flames to be pulled into the direction of the cook chamber. Alternatively, I just crack my firebox door about an inch, and this encourages the flames to move directly straight up and down and not be pulled into the cooking chamber. Now here's a fire and coal bed that's located in a great spot close to the firebox door. There's a very large coal bed with a strong fire and large flames. And the great thing about this location is the flames and extreme radiant heat aren't creeping into my cook chamber. I can load both the left and right sides of the cooking surface with food and I'll get even temps and even cook times throughout the entire cook. Just compare this shot to the previous shot, you don't see any flames coming into the cook chamber. Here's my wood pile. On the right I have some red oak and white oak that's custom split to my preferred length of 14 inches but it has about a year left to be fully seasoned. On the left I have fully seasoned hickory and cherry that I'll be using for today's cook but unfortunately these splits are 16 to 17 inches long so I'll need to trim them down the length. I'm using a Black & Decker alligator loppers to trim my splits. I purchased this tool for around $80 and I highly recommend it. It's an efficient and very safe tool. If you don't have experience with the chainsaw this is a great option. Also, it's much safer than a miter saw. I used to use a miter saw, but after hearing the fifth story of someone losing a finger trying to cut a split, I decided to err on the side of caution and buy this tool. Now these leftover chunks do not go to waste. I will use these chunks at either the beginning of my cook to start the fire or towards the end of the cook once my food is wrapped. And that takes care of the length of the wood, but if the diameter of the wood is too thick, I'll use my Kindling Cracker XL to split the wood 
And as you can see, this tool makes the job very easy and I highly recommend this tool. I prefer my splits to be about three to four inches thick. This particular split is the perfect size split. Another key factor in fire management is having well seasoned wood that isn't too wet. Wet wood will cause inconsistencies, smoldering fires, which will require several more additional fire checks. I'm using a moisture meter here and my target moisture level is anywhere between 10 and 15%. And I'm ready to go. I've got my wagon full of wood. The amount of fuel in this wagon is good for about eight to 10 hours of smoking, depending on my temperature. So let's get that fire started. It's been 45 minutes since I started the fire and I'm ready to break down my coals, shape my coal bed and add my first split. I typically check the fire every 30 minutes and on average I'm using about one split every 45 minutes. My target temperature today is between 250 and 260 degrees. Right here I'm going to place my first split parallel to the firebox door. This hickory split is well seasoned and it'll take less than a minute to engulf in flames. It's 45 minutes later and I've just added the second split and I've been maintaining my target temperature for the entire first hour. You can see here my pit is running even with temperatures between 250 and 260 degrees. My first split is ready to be broken down to replenish my coal bed. The first split is burned evenly breaking down into consistent sized coals. My coal bed is looking great and generating a ton of heat so for now, I'll continue to run my fire with only one split on top of the coal bed. It's 30 minutes later and that second split still has about 50% of life left in it. I'm at the hour and 15 minute mark into my cook and my temps continue to hold stable at my target temperatures. I'll need to add another split in about 15 minutes or so. And as far as my stack, I'm running with the damper wide open for this cook and have very clean smoke. Okay, so it's 15 minutes later and you can see in the lower left corner, my temp has dropped slightly under 250 degrees. My second split still has some life in it and typically I wouldn't need to add a split here, but my temperatures are still dropping. And that's because my coal bed is getting pretty small and not generating much heat. My number one priority is not to lose my coal bed. So I'll replenish it by using two splits on top. Also, the second split on top will help compensate for the heat loss from the smaller coal bed, and I'll continue to maintain temps. It's 20 minutes later and my temps did not drop any lower than that 250 degree mark. And again, I'm maintaining my target temps. The split is ready to be broken down into coals. And as you can see, I've replenished my coal bed. The coal bed is looking really good now, generating a ton of heat. And as a result, I'll only need to run my fire with one split on top. The thesis of this video is that it's a balancing act. If the coal bed is healthy and generating a ton of heat, I'll use one split on top. If the coal bed is too small, I'll use two splits on top. This ensures I never lose my coal bed while maintaining my target temperatures. It's 30 minutes later and my fire has been running flawlessly. I'm two hours into my cook and I'm averaging one split every 45 minutes. I'll show you one more fire check and then stick around to the end and I'll show you how I combat fire management's worst enemy, the wind. It's 15 minutes later and my third split still has plenty of life left in it, but a very similar situation to a few splits back. My temperature is still starting to drop and that's because my coal bed once again is too small and not generating enough heat. I'll rearrange my coal bed, I'll run my fire with two splits on top again, and I think by now you guys pretty much know my routine, the balancing act of rotating between one or two splits on top, depending on the health of my coal bed. And one other note, whenever I'm running the fire with two splits on top, I always put the new split closer to the firebox door because the flames will always get a little out of control when the split first ignites. And finally, fire management's worst enemy is the wind. A calm day makes maintaining a fire so much easier. Wind coming in the direction of the firebox can create a wild, unpredictable, and ashy fire. And wind coming in the direction of the stack can create back pressure, reducing convection, and making the right side of the cook chamber cook hotter. 
Here's a couple of solutions I came up with to mimic a calm day, even on the gustiest of days. Well, everyone, thank you for watching the video. I know I went over a lot of information, but hopefully some of these tips and techniques you can use at home on your own pits. If you have any suggestions or questions, just let me know in the comments below. And thank you so much. Thank you.